All right, I think we're ready to go. Um, we're just going to review a lot and then pick up some things, some loose ends that we didn't get to from at the end of uh, last time. So to review, um, the passage that we're looking at in Matthew 24 is about from the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves you know that summer is near so also when you see all these things you know that he is near at the very gates truly I see you that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away so before we review all this I think it'd be it'd be wise and we'd be prudent and it would be the right thing to do to open real quick with some prayer Lord thank you so much for your word and and the riches that can be mined from your word there's so much there that um, it's staggering and it's humbling God we pray for wisdom and understanding insight in your word we pray that you would um, Help us to clear our thoughts from the day, um, any distractions anyway, and to focus on you and your word. And um, Lord, we pray for clarity, again, wisdom and understanding, all for your glory, for your sake, in Christ's name, amen. So the whole point of why we were starting this is, is um, this is where we landed in Matthew 24, and we're We've been looking at trying to um, narrow down and confirm the timing of the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation is the 70th week of Daniel. It's um, the final week in history, current history as we know it, before we go into the tribulation, millennial kingdom, and then who knows. So... Again, we went over this whiteboard here, and we looked at terms like that day and in those days and that generation and a bunch of different terms that kind of some of the passages really include um, phraseology that sounds an awful lot like uh, they cross over. Here's this chart here that I did not have live last week, but I got live now. And all this is, is, if you need some study and you're looking for something to do sometime, these passages of Scripture, um, I've never really laid it out, mapped it out like this before, where um, regardless of what's going on with the black arrow and above, just taking those verses below, and looking at the topics of those verses, um, Amos 9, you know, it, it covers, it talks about the beginning of the restoration, God bringing Israel to the land. So to back up, Bible prophecy addressed, Israel being scattered to all the nations, and the land becoming a desert land and being a wasteland. And then that's it in Bible prophecy, nothing. Um, the Bible is silent unless you find something you let me know, but the Bible is silent on all the intervening years other than just generally um, they're um, victimized and not in the happiest place with all the different various nations. And then we don't have anything in, in Bible prophecy specific or great until the, uh, the restoration or the regathering together where God says, I'm going to bring you together. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to bring you back into the land from all of the nations. It, the land's going to be a desert, but it'll bloom again. Um, you'll, you will again um, enjoy the fortunes of your fathers. And um, the famous dry bones prophecy about how it's, the land is going to be repopulated again. Now the arrows, the red arrows going back and forth, from one section to the other is about um, 
really they share um, cross topics, if I can put it that way. The beginning of the restoration, the tribulation, wrath, that era that's we're still waiting for, and then the fulfilled, complete restoration that happens in the kingdom. So there's a lot of kingdom language, and this is how I'm going to restore your fortunes, and you're going to serve the king, and he's going to sit on the throne of David, or he's going to be the prince, and he's going to... Different language, different passages. So, for instance, at the top, Ezekiel 30 will talk about um, the tribulation, wrath, and what's going to happen. And it's it's wrath upon the earth, and it's it's punishment, it's judgment for Israel because of their unbelief. But then they all become, he says, but... But don't worry, I'm going to bring you all back and I will fulfill my promises and I will restore your fortunes and all this kind of thing. And that's when you get into fulfilled restoration at the very end. Some of them talk about all three topics. So that kind of shows that cohesion between beginning restoration and tribulation week and fulfilled restoration really kind of shows that all of those are kind of that final generation, one big grouping. So that's why that chart is um, laid out like that. Any any questions about any of that? And you sent that out in an email, right? I sent that out in an email to everybody. Again, it's I would encourage encourage you to just to get a complete understanding of what's going on in this whole fig tree generation and the final generation. Um, I would encourage you to go through all those passages. Be the Berean, don't take my word for it. Read those verses and you'll see that, read the verses outside of some of those verses that are listed. Those are the central verses. But. So how do we read it? We just start on, on one and follow the arrows? Yeah, any old way, any old way you want. Pick, yeah. pick one. I mean, um, I mean, if you wanted to read just the things about the beginning of the restoration, oh, yeah. You know, you could just read down the yeah. column, but otherwise you could read across. I would encourage you to read across, though. Yeah. Now, um, there was a on, a, on a Facebook post the other day, It uh, there was a guy challenging, saying, I, I don't believe in that, that 1948 stuff, you can't take any of that to heart at all. He said, 1948, that's just the date man did that. That's something the United Nations did. God didn't do that. So the way I pushed back was I kind of mentioned, well, it's kind of interesting, though, because you're saying, for one thing, that God is a sovereign, that he doesn't control the actions of man. But the other thing is that when you look at Ezekiel 38 and you have Gog and Magog, what is God telling Gog? Gog, at one point, he starts off the chapter saying, hey, I think we need to go down there into that land of unwalled villages where they're dwelling in peace and safety, and we should go down there and, and, and basically, you know, looking to pillage Israel. You continue reading in Ezekiel 38, and God says, and I will lead you. I will lead you by the nose. So God is the one who's leading Gog. So Gog, whoever that is, this leader of this coalition, thinks he's in charge, but really God is the one ultimately behind. So 1948 is a, is a date, and, and this guy was saying it means nothing. But the problem is, is that these conditions are in these verses. And that's why I say read these verses in that, in that far left column, the 1948 column um, about beginning of restoration. And you see the conditions, and the conditions are very specific. The conditions are that nobody was in the land. It was a desert land. Owls and coyotes dwell there. Nothing's growing. Nothing there but Bedouins. And then all of a sudden in 1948... God is bringing them back and bringing them back into the land. Now, can those prophecies be fulfilled if, if the fig tree generation does not start until the beginning of the tribulation? Or if the fig tree generation does not start until after the, any time, even now? you got a problem because the prophecies specifically say that it's the, God is going to bring them in in a, in a time when it's desert, when they've been scattered to all the nations. You can't bring them in now because they're already there. Who's there now? They would have to leave again for God to bring them back in. And make it a desert. And you have to make it yeah, a desert right. again. Yeah. And the Bible does not talk about this happening multiple times. And so, in fact, it's so unique, it's rare. Where, where's the, the famous passage? Is it Isaiah 66, 8 and 9, I believe is where it is? You know, has anybody seen such a thing that this could happen in one day? 
that they'd be brought back because this just doesn't happen. So that's where we we get back again, like I said, to uh, the passage about the, the fig tree generation and um, God bringing them all back into the land. So, so, so remember that we, just to recap, we start off with this. The Olivet Discourse is all about the beginning of sorrows and, and um, this threefold question in Matthew 24. And it centers on the beginning of sorrows and, and this big thing that Jesus had described in the temple. Remember Luke 21 talks about all the events leading up to the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus is talking about the beginning of sorrows and says, well, that, you know, um, not yet. There's, there's more to come. Before that happens, this is going to happen. And he talked about the events happening around 70 AD. Matthew 24, is the, the language is and then or um, after that. Okay, this is going to work. There we go. So then there's the whole question about where are the prophecies? Where are the prophecies between 70 AD and 1948? There's nothing. But there's all this language about and then and in those days and things concerning the end. And it covers everything from the restoration going in, in, into the kingdom. Uh, so as you get into, again, resolving power we talked about, uh, you get greater and greater clarity the more you zoom in on the scriptures, which is what we tried to illustrate with the, even the stars, how that originally, um, when you looked at stars, you thought you saw individual stars, but it turns out that the, those very often weren't individual stars, but they were whole galaxies out there. That we were unaware of and the same thing with scripture if we bore down into scripture we begin you know resolving power we begin to see greater clarity in what's going on um so i'm not going to go through all these verses these verses are some of the ones that are listed on that chart that i showed you that i sent in in email but again language here is in that day and he's going to restore the fortunes of my people israel ezekiel 30 is a big one he's talking about uh Woe, woe for the day, the day of the Lord, and a time of doom for the nations. Okay, that's the tribulation period. Um, again, Jeremiah 30, restore the nations of my people in that day. All that kind of language. So we're not going to go through all these again. Definitely not going to go through um, Ezekiel 36 and 37. Ezekiel 36, though, he's, there's this prophecy, I scattered them among the nations. That would have to happen again as we discussed before fig tree prophecy could repeat and we you know that the land would have to be abandoned and, and restart the whole clock all over again so 37 is the dry bones prophecy gog and magog it all talks about in the latter years so that's another phrase here besides in that day and in those days in that generation he'll say the latter years um the land is restored from war whose people were gathered from many peoples, which had been continued waste. The people were brought out from the people and now dwell securely, all of them. See, that's 1948. There's no restarting all of that. Ezekiel 11, um, the land's given as a possession. I removed them far into all the nations. I scattered them into all the countries. Okay, and then he, he, um, he assembles them. Again, those are really key to um, watch out for Lord restoring Israel. That's in that language is all throughout the scripture, all those verses that I gave you. Um, see, therefore, I'll, I'll hurl, you, hurl you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your fathers have known. Um, and then the restoration. The days are coming. The Lord uh, lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries. So it's not just about being slaves to some country, this is uh, the latter days, where he had driven them, bring them back into the land that I gave to their fathers. Um, I'll make them know, I'll make them know my power and my might. So that's the question that brings us to this is in these areas, areas here. So now we've got this is where we're, we're getting into territory that we didn't get into last week, and there's not a lot of these slides. This is really kind of the end, but I want to try to 
make a point of showing that this is all one big um, group that's in this um, all these things language. So Matthew 24 again in this in, is this language. Um, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, all what things, all the things that he'd been describing, describing in the chapter, you know that he's near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So this generation is described as a specific people who... What? They would see all these things. So that defines who the generation is. Okay, so um, so identifying whether the fig tree is Israel in this parable, whether Jesus is simply speaking generally about how once spring gets here, summer's just around the corner. It isn't really critical to the text because he goes into detail and tells us all the all the uh, events, all these things that are supposed to happen. And we saw these verses that describe all this in this final end time in, that we're living in that day or those days. Um, Matthew's audience is primarily for the Jew, but Luke is written to the believing Gentiles primarily. We can leave it at that, noting that Matthew mentions only the fig tree, which would be a significance to the Jew, but not so significant to the Gentiles in, in Luke's audience. But um, here's another possibility, because remember, Luke talks about and all the trees. So we're going to get into and define some of that a little bit too. A couple, couple different possibilities, because I want to lay them all out there for you. So since we've seen that Luke addresses desolation number one in 70 AD as an incomplete fulfillment or an interrupted prophecy, we could put it that way, um, there is then a different order of events significant to those living in that time for um, the warning in Luke. In Luke, the Gentiles are told, when you see the fig tree and all the trees. So while simply seeing Israel might not be as much of a sign as, um, as this, and all the trees, but what, what might that mean? Just as we see the fig tree as um, symbolism for Israel, we can see the same is true of the Gentile nations in the Old Testament. This is this happens. We can read from the text in verse 20 that Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by armies. But what are they to look for? Verse 24 will tell them in Luke that um, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. Then... Um, we know now much later into the future, of course, about the tribulation, judgment, and uh, the Son of Man coming in glory. So then Jesus gives the parable in Luke, verses 20, chapter 21, starting verse uh, 29 and into verse 30 and following. I would simply state the significance for Jerusalem in 70 AD and Luke's prophecy is about the fig tree, Jerusalem, and all the trees. Um, which I would say is possibly the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem. So when you see the fig tree and all the trees, um, is a warning about all these nations because the Roman Empire was the civilized world at the time. I think I went over the list last time of all the countries. There's uh, at least a couple dozen here of different nations that were part of the Roman Empire. So they were being surrounded by all the trees, all the nations in, in the, embodied in the Roman army. And that was unique to that time. That's not going to be so about the us watching for the end times and the tribulation. The big thing is, is that the world is completely populated and it's you know, a fully populated world at the time. And you got this desert land out there and all of a sudden now, uh, Isaiah 66, lo and behold, yeah, Israel's a nation again. So when you see the fig tree, come and bloom. And that's a kind of a weird, unique thing that it doesn't happen. What other ancient um, nation has disappeared and then made it come back? Can anybody think of something like that? I can't think of anything. So it's a unique thing. So it is a, mir a miracle. It's something that God ordained and then he's done. The United Nations didn't do it. You know, Israel didn't do it. 
World War II happened for a reason. Six million Jews killed for a reason. Hitler for a reason. Part of that overall God's plan created a worldwide sympathy to even Israel's enemies, Jewish enemies, were kind of, they weren't going to speak out and say, no, they can't have their own land. Even they kind of um, acceded to the whole idea that that they should uh, be allowed to have their, their own land. So is that something that the Jews had voiced that they had wanted the land back? Or? Yeah. Um, there is, uh, what was the name of the movie? It was a really cool movie. I thought they did a good job with it. A woman called Golda, about Golda Meir. And she wasn't the only one. There, there were a few. But Golda Meir was the first prime, prime minister of uh, Israel at the time. And, um, and gosh, you, you caught me. I've got a drawing a blank as far as the guy's name, famous, famous name. And it just flew out of my head. Um, to think about what his name is but there are a couple people who are really pushing for this they really had a burn to this is our land there's always been jews living there even after the diaspora when they were scattered there are always a few that were living there and it became a desert and a few of the better ones from other nations palestine has always had jews in it there was never a time when it was completely jew free it was scattered but there were always a little bit of room in there hanging out so they were pushing for that um because it was their right, and whether they knew the scriptures or not, and knew what was how much of it they knew, and how much of it they were trying to see scripture fulfilled, I, I don't know. I couldn't speak to that. So, to to look at um, fig trees um, in about Israel in the Old Testament, it's a couple passages. This one in Joel one verses six and seven: For a nation has come up against my land. Powerful and beyond number, its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. So it's talking about my land, and it refers to it as my fig tree. It is stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Hosea is another one. Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel like the first fruit on the fig tree. In its first season, I saw your fathers, Hosea 9, 10. Um, Jeremiah 8. At that time, declares the Lord, the bones of the king of Judah, the bones of its officials, the bones of the priests, the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be brought out of their tombs. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? And they refuse to return. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. And what I gave them has passed away from them. Starting from verse 13 there. Jeremiah 9 continues with more about the diaspora and their regathering. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. So were they scattered in 70 A.D.? They were scattered, they were scattered uh, at the fall of Jerusalem. Now, 70 A.D., again, to reiterate what we discussed last time, um, the Roman armies staged, prepared to lay siege to Jerusalem. And things had gotten out of control, and many of the Jews were resisting at the time and were even slaying some of the soldiers and so forth. And the emperors had had enough, the seizures. Then the, you know, there was a death, Nero died. So there, it created a pause where, okay, they had to hold everything now, decide who's going to be in charge. And Vespasian had to, he was the key general at the time, he was going to um, lay siege to Jerusalem, he had to go back, put uh, Titus, his son, in charge. He was a general at the time, later he'd become, he would become a Caesar, he would become emperor. But during that time, the Christians remembered what Jesus warned about in Luke, and 
they said, hey, this is it. We're surrounded by the nations. We're surrounded by Romans. Uh, we need to leave. Just take everything. Just go. So it wasn't closed off yet. So they headed for the hills. Mm -hmm. And Josephus and other historians said that not one Christian died in, in that siege. It was a siege that went on for a long time. Once they decided to continue, they pushed up mounds around Jerusalem and they blocked it all off and they closed it off and um, they began starving. They had eaten at some point, according to, I think it was Josephus. I mean, they'd eaten their belts. They had leather vests sometimes. They had even taken their leather vests and they'd you know, cut them up and tried to boil them and cook them and eat eaten those. They'd eaten all kinds of things. Um, they were eating their young outside of Jerusalem. inside Jerusalem oh, in the inside. walls. They were, oh, because they couldn't get food, yeah. And so it wasn't until that point where um, it was completely laid waste. They were completely decimated. Thousands of Jews died. This is specifically 70 AD, though, okay. that happened. And they were, had, once again, they were enslaved to the Romans, but they had rejected the Messiah, which has been prophesied that they would. In fact, the scripture says when we read Romans 11 that it was God that blinded their eyes for a season. Um, God blinded their eyes for a season, and thank God because in, in a way that's his mercy for the Gentiles, for us, that we get the gospel. We're in this period here where um, you know we get to enjoy the benefits of, of the gospel of Christ and... By being saved, we get to enjoy all the promises that were given to well, I'm just Israel. I'm trying to make the distinction between the first time they were sieged by Babylon and they were scattered, but not to all the nations. When they no, not to, all, to the all, all the nations. That's the 70 AD. That's the 70 the AD. One, they went back in. The cupbearer guy was his name. They all went back in and rebuilt them. Correct. Me, mine. Thank you. So then, the second time that you're talking about, I'm just make. I'm trying to get it right in my head. So yeah. the second time what you're talking about is actually the diaspora when they were scattered to all the nations. Scattered to all the nations. Okay. And that's for me. I don't know if that helped you, Debbie. But when yeah. when it's talking about to, scattered to all the nations, that is the diaspora. They never come back from that. Right. Well, what until until so, 1948. Yeah. So they they scattered in 70 A.D. They were taken over by the Roman army, and. Uh, most of them were slaughtered. There were a few survivors. They were scattered to all the nations. Um, and then they tried to make a bit of a comeback. There was a handful of them, and I think it was about 135 A.D. They tried to make a comeback again. They, so they had the bright idea, let's try this again. And the emperor at the time said, no, that's uh-uh. And he's put a stop to that. In fact, they even plowed part of Jerusalem under, tore it under, and they renamed the land called Palestine. No more. No, there's no more Israel. No more Jerusalem. This is Palestine. And that's when they did that. It was 135. And then the last few remaining ones scattered most of them to to the nations. And all that remained so until 1948. Almost 2,000 years. It's a long time. So no nation's ever come out of anything like that before. This, this is divine intervention. So uh, Jeremiah 9, again, it's as the heading is here, it's not unlike Ezekiel 37, which is the dry bones prophecy. Let's take a look at that because it's, it's key. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on, um, on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. So this sounds very similar. It's like, like an echo of uh, Jeremiah chapter 9 that we just read. Uh, verse 4 says, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So what's up with the prophecy to? That's the prophecy for what ended up being fulfilled in 1948. That one, okay. Okay, so now I want to I reiterate here that that 
the, this prophecy about the regathering, it is true. It does not see its ultimate fulfillment, its complete fulfillment, just like the Abrahamic covenant about the borders. When God took Abraham, set him on the mountain, said, as far as your eye can see this way and that way, and all, that's going to belong to your children. Although Israel in the past has occupied that land, and they occupy that land now, they've never in history ever occupied all the borders that were promised. So all of these prophecies, everything finds its nexus, its complete fulfillment in the kingdom. So at the second coming, uh, grapes of wrath, Jesus final judgment on, on the nations in the world, and um, this, the sheep and goat prophecies, There's, and then he uh, begins to establish his kingdom. He says, behold, I'm making all things new, so he's got to clean up the earth because it's kind of a mess by that point after the whole tribulation and all the wrath of God and man's wars and all the stuff going on, disease, and it's going to be a mess. So Jesus is going to start making all things new, and that's where we see the ultimate fulfillment of all of these prophecies. So Though it might be interrupted or it might be in stages, we see the ultimate fulfillment in the future. And that will also be the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy from the scroll in Isaiah that Jesus read when he first started his ministry. And he opened it up and he read down through part of the passage and he stopped. And I think I've got that in here and we'll just review it real quick. Let's continue, though. Um, there's still more in here like uh, Jeremiah 24 about the past says, then the Lord, or then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to the land. So that's the regathering. And then in the future, we've got, I will build them up, not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. So they're there now. They're not going to be plucked up. This is it. Um, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. So you have kind of a near fulfillment thing, but then you also have some far fulfillment things that are going on. And this is typical of Bible prophecy where you've got, a partial fulfillment kind of close in time-wise and then a future great ultimate fulfillment that um, happens. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Any more questions or insights? Is this kind of coming into focus now? No, last week was kind of the fire hose. <laughs> okay. A lot of verses. You had some time to chew on it. Maybe a couple of you got to watch video and then Go through it a little bit more slowly, plus the notes I, I did and things. So, it, is it? But is it starting to come into a little bit focus now? What? How all of these going from 1948 begins the fulfillment of these, and it it really does span into the kingdom. Um, have you talked about what this generation means yet, or is that something? A little bit, and and that's kind of what we the whole thing is that we're talking about is that these verses in that one chart. They're kind of lumped in together. Jesus, when he says this generation, um, and, and we'll look at it again more closely, it's this generation that what? This generation that sees all these things. Um, so it's very specific people who what? The witnesses of seeing all these things. So this generation, um, a generation can be a series of events. It can be a particular people. Sometimes it's not a good thing. Sometimes it can be a generation, like people are always looking for, oh, we're looking for the final generation, and the generation's 40 years, and when's that? Well, then, you know, that doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. Well, in this passage over here, it says the generation is, you know, 70 years or 80 years. Well, over here in this psalm, it says the generation is 90 years, you know, or 80 or 90 or whatever. So a generation can be a span of time. A generation depends on the context, 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 with everything that we always read, because depending on what you're reading, uh, it might be um, years or it might be a specific people. Um, remember the passage, you generation of vipers? What is he talking about? A 40-year period where all these people are vipers? No, he's talking to specific people like the Pharisees who are, um, you know, they have certain characteristic and they, they profane God, they kill the prophets, and, 
you know, they have a, a certain attitude of bent of unbelief, unfaithfulness, and so forth. So the generation can be to very specific people. A generation can be the people, in this case, who witness and see certain events. So he says, this generation that sees all these things is what it says in Matthew, what Jesus said in Matthew 24. So all these things, to again to see what all these things are, you have to go back and see what Jesus has been talking about in the whole chapter. So this generation is the one who, ones who, when you see all these things, this generation will not pass. So it's all kind of, so it's this generation who sees all these things. These are all the things he's talking about, not the dates. Um, this generation is the one who sees all these things that it describes the restoration beginning here, all the way up to events that happen in the kingdom. That's what we find when you're getting all these passages and pull them all together. So with that, we're saying that that starts at 1948. Um, it's my opinion. So, <laughs> um, so if if uh, if I don't know. Okay, let me think about that. <laughs> yeah, because again, again, 1948, the 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 fulfillment of the verses about the restoration are very specific to where when, when God's describing when they come back, like the dry bones prophecy, Ezekiel 37, mm -hmm. is it's a desert land. It's a wasteland. It's overrun by jackals and things like this. And he brings them back from all the nations and brings them back. So that's the conditions. The only time those conditions were met when he starts bringing Israel back, mm -hmm. and it's a desert land, and in a day, they become a nation. The only time that ever happened is 1948, and it can't happen again because it's only a one-time deal. So, Was it yes. Methuselah who, um, like they waited, and they, the flood didn't happen until after Methuselah was out of the picture. I don't know if it was you or if it was Pastor J.D. because I just finished his Genesis 4 where he was going through the genealogy up to Methuselah. But that one, per, there's that, that one person that mm -hmm. he just their life could just be extended because people are like, well, they're getting right. old. The I don't know if... Born if, uh, in 1948 or... Right. Before. And that's possible, too. And a lot of times if, with the fulfillment of a, a passage, a lot of times there's doubled and even tripled meaning I've seen, too, in Bible prophecies. I don't know if J JD's ever gone into that or not. I know I blogged about it one time in the past, and it was something that uh, I was calling the Methuselah Principle. Mm -hmm. And the Methuselah pr Principle is simply... Um, in the days of Noah, um, there was a man, Methuselah, who ultimately ended up being the oldest living man ever to live. It was common for people to live to be, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred years old or so. And Methuselah ended up being the oldest one. And his name roughly translates, um, when he is gone, it comes. So almost to the day when Methuselah died and God extended his life longer than anybody else's life, kind of, to me, uh, indicative of God's mercy, give everybody the last possible chance in his patience. He dies. He shuts Noah and the family into the, into the ark, and the flood has come. So Methuselah principle, if we applied that to 1948, and a generation is in looking at, at a very specific age of people, there ought to be somebody who's seen this from the beginning, them coming back into the land. So somebody born at that time, all the way to um, the Son of Man coming in the clouds in glory, as it describes in, as Jesus described repeatedly in Matthew 24. So somebody born in 1948, the World War II generation, um, all the way up till now. Um, it could be, about, they won't pass away. About, and I think, and this is my opinion, but... Um, you know, no man knows the day or the hour. So I, I don't think God necessarily wants us to look for a date as much as signs. He keeps talking about signs and when you see this and when you see the coming of this and when mm -hmm. you see this, you know, earthquakes. and, pro and So it, it's more like, okay, it started. TikTok, we know. We know to look and watch and see. We're starting to see, you know, Iran and Russia being friends. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see, I mean, geopolitically, um, the earth itself and the earthquakes and whatnot are right. happening. We're starting to see... So it's like we know, we're looking, we're seeing, we know the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessary. I don't think God's um, 
inspiring all of this and right. all this that we're supposed to be. Well, I mean, for. he's always gone by signs, right? He's never calendared anything. He didn't calendar the flood. Yeah. I mean, in his mind, he did. Yeah. And and you can. It's interesting that the coincidental. It's another study. I'm not going to go into it tonight, so don't ask me. But you can look it up yourself. And Mister goes into yeah. that. But it's interesting the coincidental dates of when the flood happened, and you can look at the Jewish calendar when it happened, and you can calculate and figure it out. And when the flood ended, and it corresponds with other dates in history that are very key well, so, well, right, concerning Christ. Get, like the tribulation is going to be seven years and three and a half. And he, he, right. Those are very That's a span key. of time. It's not quite but calendar, but it, yes, it's yes. a very so specific span of time. In, though, I don't think he gives it. You know, it's when the fullness of the Gentiles, it's when that last person mm -hmm. saved and then we're going to go. However, like I said, we can look at politically what's going on, earthwise what's going on, what's going mm -hmm. on in our church, what's going on. So it, it's more about like birth pains. He mm -hmm. says birth pains. So he gives us, what do you call it, like a dipstick to go, oh, it's getting worse, it's getting worse, it's getting worse to start looking. So mm -hmm. I think the whole point of that generation and giving kind of signs, what is that, I don't want, I mean, they're signs and they're getting worse and whatnot, so we're just looking up and watching and waiting. Yeah, signs have to be not just, oh, look at there was an earthquake over there, but they have to be significant enough to go, oh, I, that's a big enough event, that's a sign. Yeah. You know, so they've got to be that kind of that kind of a thing. And he tells us to look up, not to count. Well, you know, right. In, this, yeah. in, this, in the fullness of the Gentiles, in this time, we're Because he up. says, and I think it's in Luke, when yeah. you see these things beginning, Look up for your redemption draws near. Yeah. So I wonder in 1948 when this was all happening in the news, were the churches talking about like oh, oh yeah, oh, it's yeah. Happening. big time because I think a lot of churches at the time had kind of written it off and thought well maybe that was just kind of symbolic, which is an unfortunate way to look at it because when Jesus came the first time, and all the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Christ and there were myriad of prophecies. They all were fulfilled literally, not symbolically. Um, a lot of people thought and still think that symbolically the church is the fulfillment of Israel. So really kind of it's symbolic and it really it represents Israel. You know, the end, last days Israel is really the church. There's too many differences. And that's another study. Um, but people with, for instance, the all-millennial perspective will hold that view that we are fulfilled Israel, of which... There are so many issues that we've touched on a little bit, and we'll get into more, but um, it, 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 it doesn't work. They want to have all the blessings that Israel got, but what about the curses that Israel got? Yeah. Nobody wants to have those. So if you're the fulfillment of Israel, are you going to fulfill those curses too? And if we're the fulfillment of Israel, then why aren't we in Israel? Oops. And who is that over there? Because you can do run the DNA now too, and you find out, guess what? All 12 tribes of Israel are over there right now. So there's a big oops there. So there's a disconnect. And that is the big elephant in the room is that there's Jews over there in Israel, and we're not there. So, but no, exactly right. The signs are, are what they we go by. And, understood it when it was happening. Yeah. yeah. And they're kind of, at for a while they were kind of thought about, you know, kind of writing it off like, well, I don't know what that means and what we're supposed to make of that. Because it's, uh, there, there was, uh, I mentioned, I, I think, last time that Mark Twain was kind of a contributing um, columnist or writer, whatever, he wrote an article. I think it was in um, uh, Look or Life magazine. It's probably Life. I think Life was bigger than Look. So I think it was Life magazine with photos, accompanying photos and things. And he's, he mentioned, he remarked on how I've never seen such a wasteland in all my life. There's nothing out here but jackals and owls, and it's just nothing. It's desert. There's, it's desolate out here. And that was, of course, before it all happened. Yeah. Now, it's a garden spot. Yeah. One of the world's largest producers of citrus fruits and their technology now, you would not have, you would not have these without the Jews because of some of the technology that's in your, your cell phones and in computers and things like that. God is blessing them, just like he told them, I will restore your fortunes. The Palestinians didn't want to go back in it when it was a desert. Now they do want it. Yeah. 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 And when territories by the Jews that they held for a while, there been a couple times they kind of said, all right, and they backed off, and they've relinquished some territory that they had gained back to the Palestinians, they let it rot. And the next thing you know, you can see a clear line where they are, where it's just wiped out again, and it's just nothing. If they don't maintain it, they don't maintain their infrastructure. Well, they don't. If they don't, that's a blessing they, either. They don't, no, they don't. 
So it's a two-edged sword there. So let's continue with this, and then we'll, we'll go through some more. So Isaiah 61 says, um, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring this. This is um, what Jesus read, and hey, this is what Jesus read in the temple. Okay. Um, to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn um, in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Uh, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now that's concerning the Messiah. This one here, we show where he quit. So where it gets down to the middle of verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that's where Jesus took the scroll and rolled it up and put it away. And he says, this day this is fulfilled among you. And they're kind of going, they're looking around at each other like, what was that? Because he didn't finish the passage. So that's an interrupted prophecy. Jesus is showing he came to fulfill that much during his first incarnation. And then the rest is going to happen at the second coming, this when it's complete fulfillment. So he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed upon him. So the tribulation judgment is the verse in Isaiah that says, and the day of vengeance of our God. And the rest that I have there in the red text, that all pertains to the millennium. So we have Jesus at the first incarnation in verses 1 and 2a. And then after that, we've got the tribulation judgment, Daniel's 70th week, which is the book of Revelation. So is it coming clear now why I decided to go into the Olivet Discourse and how it's laid out? And I hope that when we get into Revelation, it's supposed to be the most intimidating book in the world for anybody to try to unravel that it'll be so much clearer. I think it's very, it's very cool. All right, so, okay, and all the trees. Let's take a quick look at that. Um, Luke's gospel that Jesus also mentioned, all the trees. Just what are we to make of this? Jesus said to learn the parable of the big tree and all the trees. We learned that uh, what is the scriptural meaning of the fig tree, but what to do with all the trees represent. And we went into some of this. Since the fig tree represents Israel as a nation, then we should expect all the trees would re represent nations as well. And indeed we do. There's a list of a half a dozen verses here. I'll read them off to you real quick if you want to write them down, but the video is going to be available. And... You can read these out, do, be the Berean, and check them out on your own. But you'll see that some of these references to trees have to do with other nations besides Israel. So uh, Judges 9, 7 to 16, and then Ezekiel 17, and then Ezekiel 20, verses 46 to 48. Again in Ezekiel, we have another one, 31, verses 3 to 15. Also in Daniel 4, verses 10 and 11, and then one more, Ezekiel, you know, Zechariah 11, verse 2. So what is astounding to discover is that all the countries, now this is key, because this is, this is a second opinion, and maybe both are true. Sometimes there's multiple meanings in prophecies about all the trees, what it could mean. I mentioned my, um, um, my preferred opinion, I think, um, which is, it didn't originate with me, that all the trees could refer to Rome and all the nations that are represented in the, in the Roman armies. But another interpretation that could be true too, maybe both are true, uh, is that all the countries that border Israel came back to be independent nation states around the same time as Israel. So there were nations, they were there, but they weren't all independent. So the CIA World Factbook discusses how Lebanon... Jordan, Syria, Egypt, they all gained their independence all between 1943 and 1952, all within five years of the birth of Israel. It's fascinating. So 
So again, to, to review, we're about done here, just to pull this all together. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out the leaves, you know that summer's near. So also when you see all these things that he's been talking about, and it was all things that span from the regathering all the way out to the beginning of the kingdom, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you that this generation, what generation? The generation that sees all these things will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So the prophecies of the Old Testament begin with Israel regathering into a desert land, dry and desolate from all the nations. Uh, that is a condition that existed in 1948, but no longer. So 1948 must be the beginning of those prophecies because no longer can Israel come back to the wasteland. This is not a wasteland anymore. And if the regathering were future, who's that that's there now? you got to get rid of them. So 1948 must be the beginning of restoration for there's no way to go back. Nothing says they leave again, quite the contrary. There's no way for the land to again become a desert and the Jews to be scattered again and to be brought back later on again to fulfill Daniel's 70 weeks, 70th week prophecy or anything. So this generation very specifically addresses a specific people group, uh, observing a specific set of events, all these things in Matthew 24, that will not pass away until all these things take place. So these Old Testament passages um, make clear a sequence of events under specific conditions. So if you look, some of these conditions that are very specific, I'm just going to list them out real quick for you. Israel would be scattered among the nations. The land would be laid waste, a desert. God would bring them back. The land would prosper and grow. God would restore their fortunes. Israel would be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. God would again be uh, honored by them during the Great Tribulation. This is going to happen, right? We're going to see that, especially uh, at the three-and-a-half-year mark at the start of the Great Tribulation when the Antichrist exposes himself, shows his true colors. There will be a big revival among the Jews in Israel. Concurrent with that is Israel's discipline and God's judging the Gentile nations during the Tribulation. Uh, God will restore the people in the land, and Israel would have the promised borders serving him forever and ever, and that speaks to the millennium. So it's like all these events from they're scattered, and God's bringing them back after they're scattered, all the way into promised borders serving him forever and ever. So for your consideration next time, hopefully we sum that all up and everything, and we can discuss it. And that is that is this in, in um, verses 30 to 44, though, but... Um, Matthew 24, verse 30, second half of it. Um, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and he will gather his elect from the four winds. So there's a gathering there by angels in, in um, verse 31. From one end of heaven to the other. Now contrast that. This would be a bit of fun, so I would do a little research here. Verse 36, but... Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of God, but the Father only, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left, two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and one left. So we've got gathering by his angels, the elect from the four winds, and in here you've got some people taken and some left. So are these the same? Are they different? Why or why not? So we'll start getting into that next time. So that's a little bit of fun research. Um, so is that about the rapture? Or is it about the second coming? So if, the, if uh, the second coming, then we must consider all the conditions at the end. So that's just a little bit something for you to chew on for next time. And um, so... Speaking of which, one of the things we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks, too, is that we're, we're going to, I don't know how long this is going to take. Who am I kidding? When we get to, to the days of Noah and all of this and we start reading these passages, we're going to look at the days of Noah and um, no man knowing and all this. But what I want to do is I also want to take that um, uh, no man knows and some of those phrases 
and we're going to watch the video. It's an excellent video that everybody should watch um, before the wrath about the Galilean Hebrew wedding tradition and how it parallels so much um, the events of the end. And this is why toward the end, in Jesus' last handful of days, on, I don't know, at least four different occasions that I can think of off the top of my head, he used wedding examples to illustrate the end. So we're going to keep an eye on that. We'll watch that video, and there's much to learn and discuss about it, so that'll be fun. So we're going to do that too. But over the years, uh, since the time of Christ, and I'm sure it's the work of Satan, um, the calendars have been so messed up. They've been so jacked up. We don't even know exactly what year it is. And beyond us not knowing exactly what year it is, um, we do know that uh, the days of the week also, and this is something a lot of people don't calculate out when they're trying to figure out. Most of us grew up probably learning that um, Passover, uh, Jesus died on the cross. Friday he went into the grave and he rose on Sunday. And we go, well, wait, that's not three days. How does that work? Well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they try to say that they count the days that they're in. So they try to calculate it that way. And so that's a very Catholic thing. That's where that all originated. Because you go back and you can even use the NASA calculations and things like this, and you can use different computer software and model, and you can go back and you can look and see Passover. Well, that's got to be around um, new moon and all this kind of stuff. And what year did that happen? Well, there's 33 AD, so that's why they got Friday as the day. That doesn't quite fit. And so they're trying to jam in what day of the week these things happen. And the problem is, is that very, very, very few go into. In fact, I've I have written a couple of rabbis and said, "Hey, what about this?" And these people are calendar experts, and they've never been written back. But that is this: is that there was one of the councils where um, they got rid of the Mendinial or Nundinal calendar that the Romans had. You know, they had the eight days of a week kind of a thing. And you had the Gregorian calendar. And you had the Jewish calendar. So they determined, let's go back to a seven-day week and, and without any regard for the Jewish calendar whatsoever. And they just kind of arbitrarily said, you know what, let's, let's say that today is Wednesday or whatever it was. They just said, let's just draw a line right here. This is it. Ever since then, the calendar is off by three days. By three days. In other words, if you want to worship for you Hebrew roots people out there who think you're following the law and things, if you want to worship on the same Sabbath that Jesus worshiped on, you better make it Tuesday. Because our current Tuesday by our calendar, we call Tuesday in the Gregorian calendar, corresponds with what the Sabbath was in the first century. Oops. Now that's, it's interesting because now you can go back and you can calculate, you can find out, well, uh, you know, when Jesus died and when he went to the grave and things like that, and it all happened on, on Thursday in 32 AD, and it all fits like clockwork. Um, and uh, there's two Sabbaths that week. you got the regular weekly Sabbath, but then you also had the unleavened, unleavened bread Sabbath that also happened. And everything falls beautifully into, into place. But you, you can't just figure out the years. But So you figure out the days of the week, and we know we're off three days, but figuring out exactly what year this is, that's another argument. That's another. You just. That's why it's the doctrine of eminence because we just don't know. Uh, let's pray. God, thank you for this night, and thank you for the chance to review and look at your word, and and uh, Lord, really a chance to have confirmed to us. It's it's a comforting thing to know that that we're living in some of the most exciting days in history. Most exciting time of, of the world. Yes, it, it would be exciting to be in the time and be around to see baby Jesus in the manger. That would certainly be exciting. There are a lot of exciting times and things to see. But to see you, Lord, fulfilling all things in the, in the culmination of all of these events where we lost paradise in the garden, paradise found, that you are lining up events the curtain might be drawn, but Lord, you are setting the stage. 
And we're living in that time where we can see all, all these things being put in place and ready to go. And the curtain draw back for the Son of Man to be seen in all of his glory. Seven years before that, Lord, at least seven years before that, we get to be taken up with you in glory, and we just look forward to that day. And Lord, I would just say, even so come, Lord Jesus, quickly. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.